Bangalore. Taiwan's space agency NSPO has sought collaboration with ISRO of India, especially in the areas of the outer space and tracking extreme weather events, said an official of the country of Taiwan. Chen Chaofeng, the system lead of the former Sat-7 program of the National Space Organization, or the NSPO, said they are seeking a collaboration in tracking extreme weather events like cyclones. On the silence of the Bengaluru Space Expo 2018, a meeting was also held between the official of NSPO and the Indian Space Research Organization, or the ISRO, in which the Taiwanese side pitched for the greater cooperation. Taiwan is prone to typhoons while India faces cyclones. We have former Sat-5 Earth Observation Satellite. We are looking to collaborate with Antrix, a space arm of ISRO on this, said Chen. The former Sat-5 450kg Earth Observation Satellite was launched in August last year. The plans are on to launch former Sat-7, an advanced version, said Chen. Chen also said that the Taiwan was also looking to collaborate with India in the area of outer space, alluding to India's first interplanetary mission, Mars Orbiter mission or the MOM or the Mangalyan, and the Chandrayaan mission to Moon. India also has plans to further explore Mars and undertake exploration program for Venus, Sun, and Jupiter. Taiwan was a part of Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer Zero Two mission a particle physics detector on the International Space Station with the purpose to search outer space for antimatter and the dark matter as part of an investigation into the origin of the universe. The meeting was very good and we are looking forward for the collaboration with ISRO. Professor Henry H. Chen requesting anonymity and ISRO official confirmed that the meeting took place. The official added that the Taiwanese side were looking for collaboration in the launch of services. The ISRO is known for providing cheaper launch options. Taiwan had active cooperation with US in the area of space and is now looking to diversify its tie with other space agencies like India. So what do you think of Taiwan ditching US and China to collaborate with India's space agency ISRO? Is this the new combination and collaboration between Taiwan and India or is this a new collaboration between Taiwan and other countries? In New Delhi, the Trade Minister of India and the UK would meet in London on January 11 as of part of the Joint Economic Trade Committee JETCO, deliberation to boost bilateral commerce. Next India-UK Joint E-Commerce and Trade Committee JETCO, meeting co-chaired by the Commerce and the Industry Minister Suresh Prabhu, to be held in the London on January 11, 2018, the Department of Commerce said in a tweet. In the last meeting, the both sides reviewed the progress and held in the joint working groups on areas like smart cities and advanced manufacturing. The bilateral trade between India and the UK dipped to USD $12.2 billion in 2016-17, as against the USD $14 billion in the previous fiscal year. India received a USD $24.9 billion foreign investment from the Britain between April 2002 September 2017 of FDI. As of India's props cheap detergent chemical imports from China, India has initiated an anti-dumping probe into imports of Chinese chemical used in the detergent following the complaints from the some domestic companies. Gujarat Credo, Emerald Industries and Chemical India have filed an application before the Director General of Anti-Dumping and Allied Duties, a DGAD, for the initiation of investigation into the imports of Geolite Fourier, a detergent gray, from China. In a notification, the DGAD said the prima facie it has found sufficient evidence of dumping of the chemical. The anti-dumping duty, if imposed, would help guard the domestic players in the sector against the cheap imports of the product. The authority hereby initiates an investigation into the alleged dumping and the consequent injury to the domestic industry itself. In the probe, it would determine the existence and the effect of the alleged dumping and recommend that the amount of anti-dumping duty which is levied would be adequate to remove the injury to the domestic industry. 
The period from April 2016 to June 2017 or 15 months time will be taken for the probe. The countries carry out anti-dumping probe to determine whether their domestic industries have been hurt because of the surge in the cheap imports. As a countermeasures, they import duties under the multilateral regime of WTO. The duty is aimed at ensuring the fair trading practices and creating a level playing field for the domestic producers with regard to the foreign producers and the exporters. India has already imposed anti-dumping duty on the several products of tackled cheap imports including from China. The country has imposed the duty on in many 98 products as on December 27 last year of 2017 imported from China. So what do you think of the new bilateral economic trade between India and UK and the new anti-dumping policy against China's imports to India? After years of neglect, African agriculture is being recognized as a powerful driver of the continent's relentless growth. Agriculture and the business of buying and selling the food grown in Africa now accounts for nearly half the continent's economic activity. Today, Africa's agriculture and food market is worth 310 billion US dollars and has the opportunity to grow to 1 trillion US dollars by 2030. An efficient sector could increase incomes, boost jobs and reduce hunger and environmental degradation while building shared prosperity. Today, Brazil, Indonesia and Thailand export more food products than all of the sub-Saharan African countries combined. It's time to change this. Despite being home to half of the world's fertile, uncultivated land and abundant water resources, African farmers get the smallest amount of produce from their crops globally. Africans import half the rice they eat and pay top dollar for it, 3.5 billion US dollars per year and more. At the country level, businesses are unable to maximize their potential because of erratic border policies, poor infrastructure and poorly functioning input markets, including for seeds and fertilizers. Lack of access to capital is also a hindrance. For instance, while Senegal is competitive among its neighbors, it is held back by the difficulty farmers have accessing land, capital, finance for irrigation expansion and appropriate crop varieties. Further east, Ghana produces fewer types of rice than Senegal, but at a significantly higher cost. The country also imports rice, but levies 40% tariffs and other charges, pushing up the price for consumers. Poor grain quality, lack of cleanliness and packaging are major deterrents for consumers, constraining the sector's performance. We still see challenges in the business environment, ranging from poor infrastructure and high transportation costs, erratic policy interventions in the agricultural markets and uh, trade, and difficulties being faced by smallholder farmers and small businesses like Freshco. There's need for uh, greater interventions in developing the informal value chains and also linking them with the form of value chains. Maize or corn is a food staple for many Africans. Zambia is competitive when importing maize. It levies fewer tariffs but fails on exports. Compared to Thailand, a major producer of rain-fed maize, it costs Zambia three times more to produce the grain because of the high transport costs, higher labor costs and lower yields. If you take an example of Kenya, which has been a major exporter of fresh produce to the EU, and smallholder farmers would grow crops such as green beans and export them to the EU market. This is not happening now because of the stringent conditions that have been put in the EU, where smallholder farmers cannot be able to meet these standards. There is need, therefore, to support these farmers so that they can be able to do business in this changing environment by giving them skills that can assist them. Cocoa is another example. It is Sub-Saharan Africa's most important export crop. Ghana, Africa's largest cocoa producer, has upgraded technology and management, but yields are low because of aging farmers and aging trees. Ghana needs a substantial boost in investment to upgrade plantations and make growing cocoa a profitable venture. 
The result of these challenges to African food production and trade is more imports and rising food prices, coupled with the rising threat of climate change. African farmers and businesses must be empowered through good policies, increased public and private investment, and strong public-private partnerships. Africa is at a crossroads. A dynamic private food industry can work side by side with governments to link farmers to consumers in an increasingly urbanized continent. By investing in the agribusiness sector, African countries can tap into regional and global food markets, make more food available locally and boost exports. Always check out below and if you like this video please give a thumbs up and follow us on social networks and subscribe to our channel. And thanks for watching, this is WC Daily, think big, think different, bye.